You can open your Bibles up to Mark chapter 2, verse 13. Mark chapter 2, verse 13. We're in the Gospel of Mark, which is answering the question, who is Jesus? Today, the sermon is entitled, Jesus Picked Who? Jesus Picked Who? We're going to learn about Jesus calling the uh, disciple Matthew, who was a tax collector. And basically, the sermon today is about the great folly of spiritual pride and the great news of grace in Jesus Christ. When it comes to building a team, let's face it, Jesus was building a team of disciples and apostles who were going to take on sin and death and Satan, and only in him could they prevail. So if Jesus is going to build a team, you would like it to be kind of a dream team, am I right? And as he looked around, there were some people who it looked like he should probably pick, but then he wouldn't pick those people. I saw a really funny commercial with Charles Barkley, And uh, the commercial is about, you know, uh, a no-brainer pick for your team. So check out this video. That's a no-brainer choice. You're playing playground ball. Charles Barkley's out there. I told you he'd pick me. Jesus was looking around, and the Pharisees were kind of like, of course he's going to pick us. We know the Bible. We're Bible teachers. We're scribes. Jesus, you know, we're the ones who belong on anyone's elite team. When Jesus doesn't pick them, and when he starts picking sinners, they freak out. Jesus picked who? We're going to learn about grace and spiritual pride today. Let's pray, and then we'll get into Mark 2, 13. Jesus, thank you that you came down, that you called people to follow you. And we are so overwhelmed with the grace found in the gospel. You didn't pick the best of the best. You didn't pick those who climbed their way up to the top of a spiritual mountain. You picked sinners like us. Lord, thank you for your grace. Show us today why spiritual pride will lead to ruin and only faith in the Lord Jesus Christ will lead to salvation. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay, Mark chapter 2, verse 13. Jesus is on the move. It says, He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, Follow me. And he rose and followed him. As he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The first thing you can write down is this. Jesus came to save sinners, not so-called saints. Jesus came to save sinners, not so-called saints. He went out walking along the sea. He had all these people following him now. He was teaching them. And it says in verse 14, he saw Levi, the tax collector, and he was sitting at his tax booth. So this, this may have been by the sea, on the road. He was like a toll booth attendant. But it would be like if, you know, you know, the IRS or whatever merchant services, whoever collects tolls on sea goods or road goods, you know, that that person, the inspector, right? That's Matthew sitting in his toll booth. And tax collectors, of course, were among the most despised people in Israel for a few reasons. First of all, because they could collect more than they had to. So the tax was supposed to be, you know, five shekels, and they wanted eight. And they would enrich themselves, and you'd walk past Matthew's house, and you'd see how he's living large, and you'd think he's so crooked, he's a corrupt government official. In addition, he wasn't a true Jew, because he is working with the Romans. And, the, and he's, he's in, you know, they, they are occupying Israel, And so he collects taxes for them and takes some for himself. If you don't feel a sense of disgust, you don't know who Matthew was. In fact, just kind of cross your arms and go, ugh. 
on par with prostitutes, on par with murderers, on par with thieves. That's what they are. They're thieves. That's Matthew. Shocker, Jesus walks by and picks him. What? Him? Why would Jesus do that? So they saw Jesus pick this criminal, or at least he's in that class, and then they realized he wasn't picking them. They didn't really want to follow him either. And so they came up, and not only did Jesus pick Levi, but then it says that Matthew held this party, this tax collector party. I don't know about you, but nothing makes for a great party than a bunch of IRS agents showing up. Am I right? I mean, wow, start the music. What? And as he reclined a table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. Scribes of the Pharisees, they're like looking in the window. What is going on in there? They saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors and said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Here's the answer. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Jesus came to save sinners, not the so-called saints. So when it comes to the heart of Christ for us, we have to realize he came for the sick. Here's a picture of somebody who's looking sick, right? This is sick. And if you're that, you probably need a doctor, right? This is a picture of your spiritual condition. And Jesus shows up and says, if you're that, you need a physician. Jesus came to call the sick. That implies that you have to agree with God on what your true spiritual condition is. You have stage four spiritual cancer, and it's killing you. It's absolutely killing you. And Jesus came to heal your soul of sin. We are all spiritually sick, and therefore we will all spiritually die. Sin leads to death, and not just physical death. Worth, worse than physical death is the second death. Sin consumes our soul so that we are not fit to dwell with the holy God. So the sin that shows up in this life will then lead to, in the next life, a permanent separation between us and God. That's how fatal sin is. Worse than any other physical illness, Jesus came to clear and cleanse and heal our spiritual cancer. The sick need a doctor. The problem with the Pharisees is they didn't think they were sick. They thought they were just fine. And that's why Jesus didn't pick them, didn't call them, because they didn't even see their need for the grace of God. So write this down. Do you believe the great news that Jesus saves sinners? Do you believe the great news that Jesus saves sinners? Matthew shows us what it means to hear the call of Christ and to become a follower of Jesus, someone who is saved by grace through faith in Christ. Even though he's one of the lowest class sinners, Jesus saved him. That's what Matthew models for us. Someone who hears that you could be called of God in Christ to salvation and follows Christ and is saved. No matter what society thought of him, he's now saved and he's going to become an apostle. Like Matthew, have you heard the call of Christ to follow him, knowing that you need to follow Jesus because you are so desperately spiritual, spiritually sick that you will die and go to hell if you don't get up and follow Christ? Is that your heart of response? Do you believe the great news that Jesus saves sinners? Jesus is preaching, and earlier in this book it told us what he preached, repent and believe the good news for the kingdom of God is at hand. Have you heard the good news that you need to repent and turn from sin, follow Jesus to enter the kingdom of God? Is that you? Is that your heart? Do you realize how much you need Christ to heal you? Are you sick and in need of a doctor? Or do you think you don't need Jesus? You're doing just fine. You're a pretty good person. You're religious and kind and nice to animals and better than your brother. And you haven't done any of the big sins. Do you think you're just fine with God without Jesus? Jesus came to call the sick, not the healthy. Do you believe the great news that Jesus saves sinners? The tax collectors were rejected by the Jews, judged, singled out as corrupt. And maybe you feel like maybe Matthew felt. Matthew lived, as long as he was a tax collector, under the eye of scrutiny of other people. 
There are some people in this room who feel like they will never deserve God's grace. They feel so unworthy. Maybe it's because of just insecurity and just feeling down on yourself. Maybe it's because you've done things or said things. Maybe you feel like one of the wildest or weirdest of sinners. You feel like such a low-class person, you would think God would never, never welcome me into heaven. Do you know how wrong you are? Do you know how wrong you are? Do you know what grace means? Grace means that the vilest offender who truly believes that moment in Jesus a pardon receives. Do you realize that no one is beyond the grace of God? Matthew shows us that. He was a crooked, among the crooked thieves who would have been dismissed as, as vile and wicked. He was called by Jesus to become not just a follower, but an apostle. An apostle. And do you realize the simple truth of salvation? I'll act it out for you here so you can see it. But Matthew's sitting at his tax collector booth. Grab the chair here. And uh, I'm going to show you how to go to heaven. Okay? So this is... Uh, this is how you go to heaven. I'm going to sit in my little tax booth here, okay? And uh, Jim, just yell out nice and loud, follow me. Follow me. All right, I'm going to do it again in case you missed it. Follow me. That's how you go to heaven. Are you following Christ? Are you following Christ? That's the only way you're going to heaven. And it doesn't matter who's sitting in that chair. Christ is calling you to get up and follow him. Repent, believe the good news. If you're following him, you're going to heaven. That's the gospel. Do you believe the great news that Jesus saves sinners? Who is saved? Never forget how we are saved. We are saved when we are sinners who are called by Christ to turn and follow him. That's who's saved. That's, that's the only people who are saved. So do you believe the great news that Jesus saves sinners? Now jot this down. Or are you still sick with self-righteousness? Are you still sick with self-righteousness? Maybe you feel religious. Maybe you feel like you've done a pretty good job. You're on a higher road than the rest of people. Maybe you've had a heart of condescension over other people. You're better than them. You think you're earning your way to God. You've done more good than bad. You've worked really hard. You've given a lot of money. You've invested time. You've done good things. You've climbed up that ladder. Maybe you feel a little elitist, a little like you're the cream of the crop, a little like other people should learn something from you. Maybe you struggle with the heart of a Pharisee. You're the one looking in the window at Jesus, sitting with those sinful people, thinking, how could God pick them? Surely he won't pick them. Surely I'm the one who's getting in. This is stage four self-righteousness. You think you're good enough to get into heaven without being radically saved by Jesus Christ. You think you're not as sinful as other people, and so you don't need Jesus. Are you still sick with self-righteousness like the Pharisees? The scribes of the Pharisees said, why is he eating with sinners and tax collectors? Problem, they're sinful too. But they didn't feel that way. They felt above that. The Pharisees, the priests, in Jerusalem, they literally had a higher road to walk to the temple than everybody else. So as you're going to the temple, you could look up and you'd see all the elite making their way to the temple too on a road above you. They'd wear fancy robes with tassels and they would, they would, they would project to you that they are the pious elite and you are far below them. Who are you to lecture them? The Pharisees would be the teachers in the synagogues. They're spiritually arrogant. They're hypocrites. That's why Jesus called them out. And they use the law as a tool, the, the law of Moses, the Old Testament. They use it as a tool to try and make you feel so sinful that you would never measure up to their standards. Are you sick with self-righteousness? Maybe, maybe that's your heart right now. Do you know the Pharisees were so arrogant? They thought that just by being around people like Matthew... I'm just around a person like Matthew, that he will make me spiritually dirty. Blech. 
I'm not even going to touch him or be around him because he's going to contaminate me spiritually because I'm so clean. Can you believe their arrogance? And yet there are some people in the room right now who think you're just fine without Jesus. You're, you're doing a good job. You're a good person. You think you're better than most people spiritually or at least self-sufficient. Are you still sick with self-righteousness? One of the most shocking things you can realize is Jesus looking around, if he's got a team of people to go and change the world, probably should have picked the Bible teachers of his day. Don't you think that's a duh? Of course he'll pick us. He didn't pick a one of them. Did he eventually pick a Pharisee to be on his team? Who? He eventually picked Paul. You want to know the most shocking thing about that? He'd rather have Judas than Paul. He picked Judas first. Paul was the last resort. Do you see the problem with spiritual self-righteousness? Are you sick with self-righteousness? Jesus came to save sinners, not so-called saints. Do you believe the good news that Jesus saves sinners like you? Or do you look around and think there's just so many problem people in this world? I can't even believe how bad the world is in the church. Don't even get me started. That place is filthy full of these people not like me. Which group are you in? Jesus came to save sinners, not the so-called saints. Now, the rest of this passage is Jesus confronting people on their self-righteous hearts. So reading on, it says in verse 18, Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. So they would fast a couple times a week. You had to fast once a year, Feast of Atonement, and then maybe morning. There were a few times you had to, but they'd go above and beyond. They were, they were regular fasters. And they were really public about it. Not so much the disciples of John, but the Pharisees. They wanted everyone to see their piety. People came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? So Jesus is being confronted again. Knowing our context, in this section, Jesus is confronted five times by the Pharisees. The first time happened last week when he healed, you know, the paralytic was lowered down in the roof, and the Pharisees were like, who does he think he is? Who can forgive sin for God? So grumbly. That was the first one. Now we just had the next one. He's having, he's having dinner with Matthew. Who's his? He's eating with sinners. That's the second one. Now here's the third one. How come he's not fasting like us? He's not fasting like us. The third one, okay? These people have problems with Jesus. Why? Because he is eating with those sinful people, and he's not fasting like us. He is around those wicked, no good scoundrels, and he's not following our rules. So this is confrontational. Write this down, number two. We learned here that religion without a relationship with Jesus is worthless. They had religion, but they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. Religion without a relationship with Jesus is worthless. They're questioning, they're challenging Jesus and his disciples, and Jesus is now going to confront them on their doom. So it says in verse 19, Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. So the first little confrontation is this idea of somebody fasting at a wedding where there's supposed to be a feast. And then he goes on to say, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, new from the old, and a worse tear is made. Second little confrontation is this idea of taking a a piece of a new garment, tearing it off, sewing it on an old garment, and then the new patch tearing away, and it's worse. Verse 22, and no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. The point of these three analogies or parables is to confront the self-righteousness of the Pharisee. Uh, So jot this down. Are you still relying on rituals and rules? This is a question for you. Are you still relying on rituals and rules? Do you think you're getting to heaven because of your good deeds, your religious effort? If I were to say, when you stand at the pearly gates, why would God let you in? If your speech starts with, I'm a pretty good person, 
This point is for you. Are you still relying on rituals and rules? These three little quick parables illustrations are warning you of just how foolish and doomed and deceived you are. The first one is this wedding. It says, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? How many of you have gone to a wedding in the last 12 months? <coughs> Raise your hand if you've gone to a wedding in the last 12 months. Okay, put your hand down. Uh, how many of you showed up to that wedding and so said, no, I'm not going to eat. I I'm good. I'm fasting because I'm so spiritual. Okay, this is meant to be one of the most foolish things you could ever hear. The person who shows up to wedding time and says, no, I'm so spiritual, I'm fasting today, is a fool. They've been planning a year for this feast, and you're just not going to eat because you're so religious. How foolish is that? Do you see how staggeringly foolish this picture is? The wedding's on, the groom's there, the bride's there, it's party time. Okay, I got married, here's a picture uh, when I got married, right? Me and Lauren, and uh, cutting the cake, all of our guests are there. And uh, we're going to celebrate 25 years next year. Isn't that awesome? 25 years next year. Uh, now, if somebody showed up to our wedding and they were like, I'm good, I'm so religious and spiritual, I'm not even going to eat, I'd be like, get out of here. Get out of here. What kind of a fool are you coming to my wedding and saying, I'm just not going to eat? You're going to like ruin the party, right? Especially if you teach others that it's time to not eat because it's fasting time. What a fool. You could ruin the feast if you fast during the wedding. This also has some overtones of the coming of the Messiah is like the arrival of the kingdom of God. It's, it's talked about several times as a wedding, a royal wedding feast, okay? Do we have that other picture of a royal wedding? Um, okay, so if you didn't eat at my wedding, there would be issues. If you didn't eat at the royal wedding, you'd be in big trouble, okay? You showed up to the royal wedding where they got this whole thing ready and you're like, no, I'm good, I'm not eating. And by the way, you shouldn't be eating either because it's fast time. What a fool! The Savior has arrived, the, the Messianic banquet is arriving, and what they're doing here is they are, they're ruining the arrival of the Messiah by taking their fasts and confronting and challenging Jesus' qualifications with them. You see what they're doing? They're taking their religion and they're using it to confront and deny Jesus as Savior. That's what they're doing. And they're going to ruin the wedding. Not only that, but Jesus says when the groom is taken away. Well, you know what that refers to? It's a, it's a foreshadowing of them killing the groom. Okay, so these religious, these religious extremists are not only going to come and not eat, but they're going to get so worked up and wound up, they're literally going to take the groom away and kill him. That's how foolish and wicked these people are. Wow, what a confrontation. What's the next one? The days will come and the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast in that day. Verse 21, no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth to an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. So this, this, uh, these parables are found in Luke as well. And Luke 5 specifies that the patch came from a new garment. So I brought a new garment here. I shop at Ross. Anybody else shop at Ross? And uh, so I brought in my new, my new garment here. I like Ross because of the deals. So this is, a, this is a $79 shirt that I found for $19.99 at Ross. Okay, uh, but in order to show you what the Bible is saying here, let's say I've got an old shirt at home that has like a tear in it, and I just got this new shirt, but what I'm going to do here is I'm going to... Uh, I can already hear people telling me not to do it, but I'm going to do it. And... Uh, Hey, you got to fix a shirt when you got to fix a shirt, okay? I haven't even worn this yet, but I got to fix my old shirt. And so I'm going to cut off this patch from my new shirt. And then I'm going to go fix my old shirt, okay? So, whew, this is a good idea. Women, have your husbands ever had really good ideas? I can't even put this back. So now I'm going to go fix my old shirt. Okay, everybody say you're a fool. I'm a fool. Not only am I a fool, is it going to work? No. How many shirts did I ruin now? Two. Okay, so I'm a fool and it's not going to work. If you are sick with self-righteousness and you're still relying on rituals and rules, you're a fool and it's not going to work. You're, you're this foolish and it's not going to work. What are they doing specifically? Specifically, we're taught here, don't 
apply the biblical law and additional laws in a self-righteous manner because you will ruin it. Don't apply the biblical law and additional laws in a self-righteous manner because you will ruin it. That's specifically what they're doing. But generally, spiritual pride will ruin you. It's generally what we're learning here. This is what spiritual pride will do. Jesus is kind of this brand new outfit that could clothe you, all your tattered rags, that's your personal self-righteous, all your tattered rags, like rags in God's sight. A new outfit arrives and Jesus offers it, and you're like, oh, I could use a part of this to fix my old messed up outfit. You're a fool and it's not going to work. If you're trying to earn your way into heaven through your own self-righteousness, you're a fool and it's not going to work. This is a warning, a warning against ruin. So there's the garment, now there's the third one. No one puts new wine into old wine skins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins. The wine is destroyed and so are the skins, but new wine is for fresh wine skins. Of course, a new wine hasn't fermented yet. So back then, if you poured it into an old wine skin, it's going to ferment, it's going to expand, it's going to break the holder, it's going to ruin the holder, it's going to ruin the wine, the wine's going to fall all over the floor. So, you know, go to Costco, buy their most expensive wine today, and then get home and just smash the bottle on your kitchen floor. Uh, you're a fool, and you just ruined your kitchen floor, okay? So do you see, the, do you see what Jesus is saying here? Three, three in a row. If, uh, and the idea is, verse 21, no one does this. Verse 20, no one sews a piece of untrunk cloth on an old garment. Verse 22, no one puts new wine into old wineskins. His audience would have been like, duh, this, this, is, this is like the dumbest person I've ever heard of in my life, Right? If you are relying on rituals and rules, if you think, I've got this spiritual thing under control, I'm a pretty good person who's measured up to God's standards, I'm going to just walk my way into heaven, you're a fool, and you're going to ruin yourself. I have to preach it in a way to warn you of your peril. You're a fool, and you're going to ruin yourself. You're this foolish, trying in your own righteousness to please God. And if you try and get others to follow you because you're so high and mighty and smart and pious, you're going to turn them into fools who ruin themselves too. Jesus said they travel over land and sea to make a single convert and turn them into twice as much a child of hell as themselves. Child of hell. Do you hear the warning? My goodness. Do you think you're good enough to walk your way into God's presence? It's like you're fasting during a wedding. It's like you're tearing away a brand new garment. It's like you're spilling out the wine on the floor. You're a fool, and you're going to ruin yourself. The arrival of the Messiah is like the new wedding, like the new garment, like the new wine. What are you thinking being so foolish? Follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. It's not a DIY. It's not a do-it-yourself follow Jesus. The Pharisees looking in the window are doomed. Jot this down. Jesus transcends and fulfills all religious demands for us. Religion without a relationship with Jesus is worthless. Are you still relying on rituals and religion, rituals and rules? Jesus transcends and fulfills all religious demands for us. If you look at verse 23, there's another altercation Another altercation. It says one Sabbath, okay, Sabbath, day of rest. It, serious matter is one of the Ten Commandments. If you, if you ruin the Sabbath, you can get yourself killed. Serious matter, okay. One Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. As they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? This is another picture. This is the fourth altercation out of five. We'll get to the five. Fourth altercation. Are they following him around? Are they hiding in the grain field, watching him? Do they have a ring cam set up on the farmhouse? I don't know. Somehow they see. And it's like they come out of nowhere. Ha ha! We got you again! You're eating on the Sabbath! Gotcha. Uh Uh-oh. Jesus could be in trouble here. He's breaking the religious law. Pharisees are catching him. Why are you breaking the Sabbath? Okay, the Sabbath was a Jewish practice of a holy day. Free from work. It looked back to creation. When God rested on the seventh day, God was in charge of the Sabbath, and he wanted his people 
to look back to the rest only God can provide. What, what was built into creation became built into salvation. It was supposed to be a day of, of rest, of salvation. God brought them in to the land of promise, and he gave them salvation. It was punishable by death if you broke the Sabbath, so Jesus overruling the Sabbath here was his way of claiming a divine status. He was divine Lord of the Sabbath. Let's see what he goes on to say. He says in verse 25, he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need, this is King David, and was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now, in a parallel passage, it also says in Matthew that Jesus said, one greater than the temple is here. And it also says that Jesus said, you have condemned the innocent. So this is an effort for the Pharisees to condemn Jesus and even to kill him soon. And Jesus claims he's Lord of the Sabbath. He's, so, he's divine. He even outranks the priests who made a judgment call to give David some of the bread of the presence. This is Jesus telling us who he is. Let's circle back here. He shares this story and says, have you never read what David did? So you know David, right? Here's a picture of David and Goliath. You know David, right? One of the greatest people in the whole Old Testament. Killed Goliath and led God's people in battle, but then he wasn't king right away. He was hunted by King Saul, and Saul wanted to kill him. So in this story, David is not yet on the throne. David is being hunted and watched because they want to kill him. Do you see why Jesus might bring up this story when the Pharisees are like, we got you! He brings up this story because they were trying to kill David, who was a, a type of Christ. That's why Jesus, one of the reasons he's bringing this up. So David once ate a few things. The priest made a judgment call because David was on the king's mission. He allowed him and his followers then to eat the bread of the presence. Jesus therefore, can also authorize eating on the Sabbath because he's greater than the priest. He's even greater than the temple. This happened in the tabernacle, and Jesus said he's greater than the temple in a parallel passage in Matthew. And that's what makes Jesus Lord of the Sabbath. Now, when Jesus said, I am greater than the temple, that really boiled their blood. I mean, let me tell you, the Pharisees, they, their faces would have turned bright red. If you blaspheme the temple, they can kill you, right? And Greater than the temple? Who does he think he is? So Jesus is claiming to be kind of on par with David here, and even greater through this parallel. Also, in the story, Jesus is mentioning David's on the run while the king is trying to kill him. This is a veiled indictment to the Pharisees, who claim to be the religious elite, the best of the best, the purest of the bloodline of Israel, and yet they want to kill him in cold blood. Their hypocrisy is what he is indicting them on. This is a veiled indictment that just like the king was trying to kill David, the Pharisees are trying to kill Jesus. They're trying to catch him and kill him. This is the divine promise ruler who would fulfill the Davidic covenant. Jesus calls himself the son of man who is the one who will rule God's kingdom forever. That comes out of a prophecy in Daniel. They are hypocrites who would ruin heaven forever if they could. Therefore, we're being warned against them. This is really rich and deep. It's basically a confrontation and a condemnation of them. So, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus has authority on the Sabbath, which only God has. All right. So number one, Jesus came to save sinners, not so-called saints. Which group are you in? Do you believe the great news that Jesus saves sinners? Or are you still sick with self-righteousness? There's a confrontation here. Religion without a relationship is worthless. If you're still trying to rely on rituals and rules, you're a fool and it won't work. You're fasting during the wedding. You're tearing apart your new garment. You're splashing the new wine on the floor. You're a fool and you're going to ruin yourself. Jesus transcends and fulfills all religious demands for us. He's even greater than the temple. So you don't have to do all of your religion to get your way into God. You just need to come to Jesus. He's greater than the temple. Now that all drives us to a final decision. Number three, how's your heart toward Jesus? How's your heart toward Jesus? 
Look at chapter 3 for the fifth confrontation with the Pharisees. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. So they already want to take him down. They've already condemned him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. He said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? He's again confronting them because they want to kill him. Um, they want to kill him. doesn't matter if it's the Sabbath. They want to kill him. And they're going to watch to see if he heals someone on the Sabbath. Their hypocr hypocrisy is just so, so obvious. They were silent. He looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched out his hand. His hand was restored. They saw another sign, another wonder, another healing. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians. Those are the power brokers around the temple against him. How to destroy him. Let's kill him. Wow. So how is your heart toward Jesus? Jesus has just revealed to us who he is. Yesterday, somebody was scamming our church. They found the staff and the leader emails on our website, and they started emailing our staff, and it was a fake email address, but they put Pastor Ryan as their name. So this person started sending scam emails to our elders, our deacons, our staff, saying, quick, I need gift cards to give them to some people in need in the congregation. Don't tell anyone. Just buy these gift cards and give them to me right now. So people start contacting me. Hey, are you asking me for gift cards? I'm like, no, it was a scam. It wasn't me. That wasn't me. So the identity thing is an important thing. Jesus is laying down his forms of identification to show us he is the Messiah. This isn't a scam. He really is the Son of God. And they don't believe it. They don't believe it. How is your heart toward Jesus? Let's do a heart check here. Jot this down. Are you full of pride, doubt, and cynicism? Are you full of pride, doubt, and cynicism? The Pharisees are modeling for us what not to do. They are arrogant, they are uh, religious, and they're fools. They've never humbled themselves before God and admitted that they're sinful. Are you full of pride, doubt, and cynicism? Heart check. Do a heart check. Do you think you're a religious good person who's going to be just fine on the judgment? You need to repent of your self-righteousness. You need to repent of your self-righteousness and humble yourself before Jesus because he's greater than the temple. Your religion means nothing to God. You need a savior. You know religious people don't go to heaven, right? You know good people don't go to heaven, right? Saved people go to heaven. Are you a saved person? When, when people ask, how are you getting to heaven, is this your answer? Is that it? Unbelievers, it's time to repent if you have never asked Jesus to be your Savior. But i got to tell you, there are Christians who struggle with the heart of Pharisees too. And it's time for you to repent also. Have you been battling feelings of pride? Have you been battling feeling like you're better than other Christians? Your externals, your standards, your Bible knowledge. People aren't as spiritual as you. If only they knew the Bible like you. You want to gather people around yourself to... Are you a Pharisee? Are you, are you creating a sense that you're above everyone else? Do you, do you feel like you're condescending with a stone-cold heart? Do you not extend compassion to those who are in need? Are you, they're called fighting fundies, they're called Bible thumpers, they're called legalists. Is that your heart? Are you a truth person who spiritually is proud of your spirituality and you condescend on other people in the church? Heaven help you. You're being so foolish. And if you're not careful, you're going to ruin yourself and those around you. No matter how... F I've, I started in college not even knowing the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's where God saved me. I got to go to Bible college. I have a Bible degree now. I could be tempted to grow spiritually proud any day. I have to keep reminding myself, this is how it works. Me. How it worked for me. How it worked for others. I want to load people up like the Pharisees with all sorts of other things. Or get people to look at how spiritual I am. Heaven help me. 
if I fall into spiritual pride? Do you need to repent of pride, doubt, cynicism? Jot this down. Are you full of faith and love as you follow him closely? Are you full of faith and love as you follow him closely? Our role models here are the disciples and the tax collector. Levi leaves everything and follows Jesus. Saved from sin, welcomed into the kingdom of God, inner circle of Christ. He has all of his sinful friends over for a party with Jesus. I love it. He's public about it. He wants his friends to meet Jesus. I love it. The disciples are willing to be interrogated and questioned because they're close to Christ. The power brokers, are, they're going to get in trouble. They're, they're thrown in harm's way. Hey, do you marvel at the greatness of the grace of God? Do you want the whole world to know that salvation is found in no other name? Do you believe that the signs and the wonders found in Scripture show that Jesus is Lord of all? Is that your heart? A heart of faith and love as you follow Jesus closely. Which is it? Heart check. Are you full of pride, doubt, and cynicism, or are you full of faith and love as you follow him closely and invite others to follow him too? Well, I want to invite the worship team up as we close out in prayer, but let's close our eyes and let's bow our hearts together. And let's do a heart check at the end of this message. Ask yourself this, where is your heart toward Jesus right now? Are you a person who thought because you were religious, because you went to church, completed some religious education, you were a member of some denomination, have you fallen into the folly of thinking that you are religious enough to go to heaven? Is it time for you to repent of your spiritual pride and become a humble follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Hey, I want to give you the chance right now in your own heart to repent, to just pray a simple prayer. In your own heart, you can say this right now. You could say, Jesus, I repent of my religion. Say that. Say, I repent of my religion. I repent of my own righteousness. I repent of my spiritual pride, and I follow you. Say that. Say, Jesus, save me. Save me and bring me into your kingdom by your grace. And maybe there are some Christians here today who are on the truth side of the spectrum. You've been around the church for a while. Maybe God is calling you out because you've grown spiritually proud. You look down on those around you. You despise those who are in need. or You've become elitist in your theology. You've paraded your righteousness before others. You want other Christians to know just how spiritual you are. It's time to repent. It's time to repent, to realize that you, every day, are living on the grace of Christ, just like the newest Christian around you. Oh, Lord, we repent of our spiritual pride, how foolish it is to lead other people to ruin. Forgive our spiritual pride. And Lord, fill us with faith and love for you, Jesus, because you've saved us. Help us to bring others to come to know you. We live hearts up full of love because of your grace to save sinners like us. It is the sick who need a doctor. Thank you, Jesus, for healing us forever. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.